Welcome to Growing E-Commerce. I'm your host, Mike Ryan of Smarter E-Commerce. Today, we're revisiting a very hot topic, and that's Google's Performance Max campaigns. You can think of it as part two to my previous conversation with Christopher Rogel. And while it's great to go back and listen to that episode, it's not mandatory. That one was really popular, but we also recognized it's possible to dig deeper. I'm going to do that a bit today. The themes I'll cover are a brief technological context for PMAX, a framework for smarter PMAX retail campaigns. So the scope of this is e-commerce, um, not lead gen campaigns, and some ideas for bringing that framework to life. If you like this episode, you can also head over to smarter-ecommerce.com and check out our blog where I wrote about this in more detail. All right, let's get into it. So let's get started with the uh, quick overview about what Performance Max campaigns are. The word campaign is in there and it's ostensibly a new campaign type within Google Ads where basically all Google ad inventory is served from a single campaign. And I say ostensibly because I, I have the feeling that when you look at this, at this campaign type, you, you see some clues out there like, the ads API describes this as a unified buying service, which I think is a very accurate description, a buying service for Google ads inventory. And there are certain places in the UI where you'll see it categorized not as a campaign type, but actually as a channel. And to me, that's, that's more an accurate description of what's going on here. I think that Performance Max is a new advertising platform that is sort of incubating or starting or emerging or growing within the old ads uh, platform. But in a nutshell, this campaign type has elements that are familiar from smart shopping, from responsive display, dynamic search, all at once. It's this kind of hybridization of, of all these previously channels or sub-channels or formats and placements, everything that was contained in Google Ads. It's now all accessible from one point, or that will become increasingly true as it absorbs local campaigns. And we see now uh, from recent news from Google Marketing Live that also Performance Max will be increasingly used to target in-store visits and, and offline sales as well. So that's not only an e-commerce campaign type, but really a commerce advertising platform. And I'm speaking here specifically about the, the retail campaigns because that's another thing is that Performance Max can serve in principle any kind of, of business model, whether it's retail or off retail, um, you know, whether it's focusing on conversions and purchases or lead generation, whatever, whatever kind of goals you might want to pursue. So I definitely view PMAX retail as a subset of this broader thing that's called PMAX. And getting back to that platform concept in the future, I think it's reasonable to expect that PMAX will be the launching pad of every new feature and capability that Google wants within their advertising ecosystem. They'll, they'll be built in PMAX and the, the older campaign types or the classic ones, the standard ones, they might never be retired outright um, or made obsolete or sunsetted or whatever you want to call it, but they'll decrease in prominence. And I think there's an extent you can compare it to the way we have these vestigial remnants like a tailbone or an appendix, things that used to be very valuable, uh, but become very peripheral over time. And they never quite go away, but they don't really get used anymore either. And we're not there yet, but talking in the more intermediate term or long term. And I think that there's also plenty of advertisers who will always use standard campaign types and which it's a totally valid use case. I think that there are use cases where performance max is unlikely to cover in the near term. And um, you'll see debates out there, people who are yeah not happy with performance max at all so far, not happy with the lack of controls, transparency. I don't really want to get into that today. Um, I think that those are actually, you know, valid, totally valid concerns. I'm not going to dispute that. But the fact is that many people are already adopting Performance Max and many more businesses will adopt Performance Max. So just want to focus on how can we use this thing responsibly? How can we make the most out of it if you're making that decision that you want to use Performance Max? 
because if we take Google at their word, there are a lot of advantages to using Performance Max. There are some mindset changes that need to occur, and I don't think that they're totally wrong. There's this idea that advertisers should focus more on audiences and channels, and I think that's broadly correct. And there's another strategy there where I see Google trying to change Google ads from a cost center sort of perspective to a value center. For example, there used to be bid modifiers and then these were basically removed or many of them were not compatible with with Google's more automated technology. And they're coming back in a certain way, but sort of from the other end rather than regulating the or setting rules to regulate what occurs on the cost side, on the bid side, they're saying, let us take care of the bidding um, and all that stuff entirely. You tell us how we can rate conversions differently for you, how we can value them differently um, in terms of, for example, setting uh, different values for different kinds of customers that you acquire and working on that side. And that information is way more valuable for Google. It's way more valuable for them to know what is something worth and how can we then pace things differently or target how aggressive should should the technology be on that way instead of the bid modifiers end up acting as a as a constraint where the advertiser is is making those decisions and it's it's really the algorithm and the technology doesn't know what's happening or why it just runs into these constraints these speed bumps and so on and if I would be a data scientist at Google, I would probably see it in a similar way. So Google's value proposition is that they have this massive amount of product data. Um, they have a massive, based on you know their shopping graph, trying to understand products across different dimensions, across different, all the data that they get from all the merchant centers out there. They've got this massive amount of audience data. They've got this massive amount of auction data. So they've got this huge amount of, of data. They understand um, in principle how different products and audiences and placements will interact with each other. And they're saying that they can take care of that stuff for us. They can they can match the, the demand and the supply more effectively than, than anyone else can. So if we accept that and take them up on this offer, I think still one of the biggest challenges that occurs here is that, you know, what happens when everyone is using the same technology? Let's just imagine that there are self-driving cars out there. Let's imagine that everyone is using the exact same self-driving cars as everyone else. This would maybe be okay if it's a morning commute, uh, making sure that there are no traffic jams, that there are no accidents. People would be pretty happy and satisfied with this. But the fact is, we are talking about businesses. So it's much more who are in competition with each other. So it's much more like a race. People want to win. People want to gain market share. People want are heavily competing for these customers. And the situation is only getting more and more competitive year after year. So this is a genuine question. What would happen if you would have a race like a NASCAR race or a Formula One race or whatever, where all the cars are fully automated and self-driving um, and using the same motor as each other, the same everything. It's, it's a question about how would any one team outcompete the others and win that race? And there, I think Google is aware of this problem. There's a really interesting article that was published recently, recently on Think with Google. It's called Bidding for Success, New Ways to Find Your Most Valuable Customers. So have a look at that. Um, and this article is written by, what's the job title? The Product Lead, Smart Bidding and Automation. That's for here in Europe. The, the author is, is the product lead for some, some of these big pieces of, of technology that are operating within Google Ads these days. And the first sentence of the article is, when everyone is doing the same thing, it's difficult to stand out. So that suggests to me that the product lead of smart bidding and automation is also aware of this challenge. And it's not just an assumption or potentially wrong assumption on my side or, or the many other people who ask this question themselves. How can I differentiate when everyone's using the same technology? So when you've got this basically a, a black box kind of a situation, 
and I don't want to lean on that too hard because people criticize Google heavily for uh, the black box nature of some of their technology. Some of that, to a certain extent, is just an inevitable outcome of the technology that that you use. Um, some of it could be an intentional product strategy, but the fact is that you're you're giving inputs like, for example, a return on ad spend goal and the budget, and you're getting outputs, some kind of conversion value, and there's not a lot of insight into what happens in between. There's not a lot that you can necessarily do to monitor, observe, or to intervene. Um, if you do get insights, because we know that Performance Max, Google is saying that they'll offer more insights over time. The question is how, uh, buzzword alert, how actionable will those be? But let's just accept that situation and find the most constructive way forward there. You've got a situation where there are inputs and outputs. That means you need to offer better inputs than anyone else. And you need to have better outputs than anyone else. And well, it seems like, hey, isn't Google responsible for the outputs? Yes and no. Here, there's a question about what you measure and why. And there's a question of, of testing and um, what you can do there in terms of output optimization so that it will yield better inputs for the next time. So if maybe in the last episode, it felt a bit wishy-washy sometimes, like maybe you can do this or maybe you can do that. I still feel that it's it's way too early to say that there are best practices for performance max campaigns. I, I don't think that anyone can credibly state that right now. Uh, the technology is still changing all the time. It feels like we're all in a, in a beta together with this. And yeah, there's just, there's just not that level or depth of experience out there yet. So something, a project that I was working on lately with uh, my, my colleagues, Christopher Rogel, who I interviewed the other day, um, and also Irene Aaron Gruber and Arnold Ecklauer, we kind of had this, yeah, bit nerdy idea. Instead of a, a best practice, we're talking about an opinionated framework. That's what we can offer right now. And largely it's building on stuff that we have already been doing for a longer time with standard shopping campaigns and uh, stuff that still seems applicable to Performance Max and that still feels right and that still should offer a way to differentiate from competitors and uh, to make sure that you're kind of chasing the right dollars or euros or pounds, chasing the right conversions. And Google has a kind of underhyped program out there. Maybe you heard of it, maybe you haven't. They call it Shopping for Business Objectives, uh, SFBO for short. And that that's a place where our ideas are really compatible with Google's. And they recently had a webinar about Performance Max for retail where it was pretty cool to see some of these old shopping for business objective slides that have been kicking around since, I don't know, 2019 or so, popping up again for, for Performance Max. And they look a bit different now. They've been tweaked a little bit and you can't call it shopping for business objectives anymore. I don't know, it's more like Google ads for business objectives, but it's very validating to see that Google still feels that this is a good way forward. And it's something that we feel is a good way forward for advertisers uh, and businesses. So it's a good sign right now that what I'll talk about is, is a solid recommendation. I'm not gonna say a best practice. We've been building some campaigns under this methodology as well. And I, you know, it's just too early. I can't, you know, whip out some kind of crazy case study or numbers that are going to blow your socks off would be disingenuous. But what I can say so far is that this is a way of better aligning these campaigns where you don't know a lot about what's going on. You don't have a lot of control and still kind of stitching them together with what you actually want in your business. So this is not revolutionary, but it is a new kind of context. It's a new technology where um, some old principles are being applied. And basically when we're talking about, I used to call this beyond click metrics back in the day, or Google calls it shopping for business objectives. The, the idea is optimizing based on what you might call business intelligence 
or the kinds of, of data that your business is producing that the campaign or the channel is not aware of. The things that Google's algorithm can't take into consideration. You know, they've got hundreds of, of signals, but there are signals that they don't have. And those are the ones that can be so valuable uh, for your business. And also how you how you kind of optimize uh, or, or how what you're measuring. So basically, when we look at this, there are many components, but some of the biggest ones would be your custom labels, what kind of data you bring in through your feed that's not conventionally available on the feed. It will be your campaign structuring. This is a mechanism or vehicle for activating that data. Um, and that's a hot topic right now in Performance Max. I'll get into that a bit more. Then it's your conversion values. What you, what you track, are you tracking revenue? Are you, track, are you tracking gross profit? And what audiences or what kind of first party data can you bring to bear? Google has been quite open to that data. Um, and that marks a big shift from, for example, smart shopping campaigns where, yeah, there, it wasn't, audience wasn't that big of a topic there, had, had limited applicability. But I think that has to, it's quite natural that has to do with what they see on the horizon ahead with privacy, with the challenges facing third party cookies and all this kind of. Um, all this kind of tracking that's available right now, they definitely will take any help that they can get and they're happy um, to receive that. But, you know, you can think about it in, in more advanced applications besides sort of the standard audience cases. Uh, what other kind of signals could I offer? Like RFM lists, for example, that's recency, frequency, and monetary value. You know, in that direction, what kind of like LTV or CLV clusters uh, can I create? Google is also working on supplying some high value audience data, and but just getting that into the campaign. Mostly though, right now, I want to talk about segmentation. <laughs> segmentation, I mean, in the past, the idea was that granularity was king or queen. And the more granular, the, the better, where even granular was kind of a bit of a, of a buzzword back in the day. Um, but how fine grained, how well partitioned your campaigns were. And it was really great advice back then to make your campaigns as granular, as segmented as possible, this kind of hyper segmentation, because this would allow you to more or less micromanage the campaigns or have an extremely high degree of control in there. Um, and I think there's an extent to which the market has anyway outgrown that. If you look at that on the search side, for example, with single keyword ad groups, these are considered red flag by many. You know, the the kind of general sentiment on that has swung in a different direction. Google is very open and straightforward that they don't want you to make your campaigns that granular. And now you'll see ideas like stag, sing, single theme ad groups, and so on. And I think what's really important here is just finding that right level of granularity, that right level of segmentation, so that it's not about micromanaging the platform. It's about finding product sets, product clusters that, that make sense to split out where there's, you know, that you're kind of building addressable chunks of, of cost, addressable chunks of conversions and conversion value addressable chunks of, of products where you can, uh, it makes sense to assign different goals to those clusters. It makes sense to budget differently for those things. And then you're on the right way to finding the optimal level of segmentation where it, it's just, it's about using it again as a mechanism. It's a way to activate uh, data that you've got. And it's a way to, make Google a little more strategic than it, because by itself, it's, it's just gonna be looking in a, at a very operative way and sort of this high volume, but low IQ way at, at your campaigns and at the bidding and at the auctions. You know, I, I heard a metaphor, uh, where was this from? Can't remember, but it's the idea of like, automation as having a million interns at your disposal. 
yeah, you want to level up from that a little bit. Just to run through our experiences so far and a bit of this framework that I've been discussing, we see, we kind of describe a non-practice, a common practice, and a recommended practice. The non-practice is a one campaign setup. You've got one performance max campaign and, and maybe just one asset group uh, for that. So there's just one budget and one row target associated with that, et cetera. It's a very easy eff- effort or easy setup, low effort, of course, uh, but you're not able to represent data toward Google. You're not able to bring things in. And we're seeing it. People are testing the waters right now. How many people would really, or how many businesses would really intend to stick with a setup like that long term? So more of a common practice in that regard uh, is to have several campaigns. And typically these will be based on uh, category or brand. And you'd have, for example, a campaign for induction cookware, campaign for cast iron cookware, campaign for baking sets. And then each one of these would have an asset group associated with it or, you know, whatever kind of theme or segmentation makes sense. So it's still quite easy to set up and you get some diversification in there, diversification in there, segmentation by category or brand. But, uh, and that's something for, for Google to work with for sure. But by no means have you started supplying Google with uh, really relevant business data at that point. So our recommended practice is to have several campaigns that are based on business objectives and business data. For example, something that was quite popular in smart shopping campaigns that you could also repl- replicate in Performance Max would be to have margin classes, high, medium, low margin as separate campaigns. And this would be a way of, if you're not tracking profit, this would be still a way of connecting that profitability data toward Google a bit more specifically than just having return on ad spend as a, as a proxy for profitability. But we would encourage advertisers to even take it a step further and think about combinations of different data points. So you could also have like a, a stock level in, in there um, or like a rather, yeah, an availability index, for example, like stock per size and color. You could bring in sell-through rate or inventory turn you could bring in product life cycle, gives us a, an item that is new to your assortment and going all the way from product launch through to overstock and trying to better regulate and avoid that situation by supplying the right advertising pressure as a product changes through its life cycle. That's related back to sell-through rate as well. You know, trying to get a little closer toward inventory optimization. Also price attractiveness, You might think, hey, doesn't Google already cover price attractiveness? Isn't that considered in the algorithm? And and here, yeah, there are all these signals that Google is considering with their bidding technology. I think the question you have to ask yourself, though, is what is Google's view on that? How is it being treated? How is it being handled? Because, yeah, definitely Google knows your price point relative to other competitors in the auction. And... Generally speaking, they're kind of incentivized to reward or promote lower price products because it helps them compete against the experience that users have when they're visiting Amazon or consumers that they have when they're visiting Amazon. And generally speaking, it's expected for more competitively priced products to have higher click volume, higher click-through rate, which is attractive for Google. Um, and if the conversion rate is good, if then the match rate between supply and demand is good, then it's it's kind of good for everyone. But still, they're thinking about price on a per auction basis. You might think about price attractiveness at a different level across your assortment at a strategic level. Like these are my loss leaders. These are my, you know, here I'm, I'm using a skimming strategy on this um category, my goal is to always, you know, slightly underprice my competitors uh, to try and grab market share there. On this category, this brand though, I want to have image pricing in place and I want to be 
can you know priced a little more premium on purpose strategically and the question is does google know any of that when when they're looking at on a per auction basis at who who how are people priced against each other how are listings priced against each other and the answer is no so just because google considers it somehow in their algorithm doesn't mean that you can't claim it back for yourself does that make sense and then we can look at plenty of other topics here return rates um, lifetime value i think i mentioned before but there's so many metrics and these kind of artifacts of your business that you can feed into the campaigns this is what i would contend this is what we need to be doing and then as i mentioned how can you make that more sophisticated how can you take that to the next level like the intersection of margin and stock or take that price attractiveness and how does that intersect with competition density how how are these things relevant for you so it is possible to over engineer this it would be possible to create segments that are too specific that that are not really addressable anymore you know the the amount of budget that there that comes into play there the amount of conversions or products at play there you you could make uh, product clusters that are just too specific and that's why analysis is so important beforehand. So understanding, um, you know, what you can do is set these custom labels in place, the data that you're interested in and thinking, hey, maybe I can segment my performance max campaigns on this basis. And in the first place, just observing, bring in that data and just observe. You don't have to, you can go with a kind of a, the, the so-called non-practice or the common practice where let's say you've got very minimal segmentation or you've got a couple segments based on product categories or uh, product type, whatever the case might be, brand. And once you've collected the data a bit, you can see, okay, what is the baseline here? How would I expect this dis distribution to look like? Um, and how is it actually looking in performance max? Are there uh, products that are kind of over indexing or under indexing. And this is the way that you can identify pockets of opportunity and start working on that basis. You can create hypotheses against which you can measure. You can, you know, say, all right, I'll, I'll activate uh, this data by segmenting. Instead of just observing, I'll segment my campaigns using my custom labels and uh, by applying these audience lists and then you actually can see if you're moving the needle or not. So how could this actually look in an account? Well, let's take uh, that very popular strategy of margin classes. Uh, by the way, I still think that actually tracking and optimizing your gross profit is, is a better way forward, but it's a very popular strategy and I think everything that's on the way toward more closely measuring or activating profit is the is the way to go because then you can you, you you can go really far astray with a revenue based conversion but if you want to hear more about that go back and listen to my ROAS pathology episode <laughs> and you'll hear my thoughts on that different different battle so in this case you could have for example a high margin campaign medium margin campaign and a low margin campaign and have a look at that high margin campaign Let's imagine that you're a bike shop. You could have asset group for bicycles, asset group for bike clothing, and an asset group for bike accessories. And then very important, you'd have an asset group for everything else. Sort of a catch-all in there. Then when you move over to the listing group uh, below that, you'd have, that's where you'd, you'd bring these two things together. You'd have high margin and bicycles under the asset group bicycles. Under the bike clothing, you'd have high margin and bike clothing. And then, you know, all the way through whatever your structure is. And of course, crucially, high margin and everything else. That's an, That would be an important listing group as a catch-all there with um, more, more generic assets in there. Yeah, then the next thing after that, yeah, the assets, the pictures, the videos, the text, um, to support each of these. And the final layer would be audience signals from first party data, things that you provide and, and anything that you might want from Google's side, what they offer. 
and then you jump over to your medium margin and your low margin campaigns and and replicate that structure so that you've got you know medium margin and bicycles at the listing group level and medium mar excuse me low margin and bicycles in the low margin campaign in order to support that structure and bring it all the way through so again i think it's it's important to view this progressively i'd say it's better to start out with less segmentation um, than more and get more complex as you go become you know just have that ambition in mind and head toward it better to start out with observing the way your custom labels behave better not to get too crazy with with assets and audiences unless you have that stuff available unless you know you've got really great assets that support uh, a lot of segmentation there unless you have got really great audiences and and different sufficiently differentiated audiences in place where it makes sense to uh, pursue multiple audiences or different audiences and the other thing that's important to remember there is that Google will view your audiences as a starting point and it, it's not a, it, it's not really a, a strict guideline it's more like when you start playing a song on Spotify or Pandora and let the algorithm make recommendations from there you can continue up updating that list um, so and and they'll continue taking that into consideration but you just want to avoid if you pursue you know a, a structure like high high margin medium margin low margin it's important that you don't get too generic you've got to find a balance here what you can support um, so that's why you know if, if the common practice is to have campaigns based on product type, for example, or category or brand, it makes a lot of sense because uh, that way you have these thematically related uh, groups and, and you can have thematically re relevant assets for that. And Google wants that. They, they want these campaigns to be asset driven and thematically linked. Uh, that's, the, that's why these are not keywords. These are not uh, products assets are kind of the central logic here uh, but we just recommend bringing that thematic logic uh, instead of having it at the campaign level bringing that down to the asset group level and at the campaign level having uh, your your kind of business logic because then rather than assigning budget and return on ad spend goals to themes which I think it's debatable how much sense that makes. You're having budget and return on ad spend linked to a specific business metric or combination of business metrics where, okay, it makes sense to assign more budget and uh, a more aggressive return on ad spend target to high margin products. It makes sense, assign less budget, and be more conservative with your ROAS goal on low margin products. That's kind of the idea there. So just some other kind of uh, recommendations here. Ideally, one product is managed by one campaign, not multiple campaigns. Those listing groups should be different per asset group. Audience signals can be the same per asset group, or you can consider having more in the case of strongly divergent personas if you've got them and remember yeah it's the soft targeting so we recommend segmenting by a product type like pants for example or whatever the case may be without a gender or age segmentation that you know you might have that at product type level one men's women's children's or something like that but just focus instead of having women's pants and kids pants um, just focus on pants and supply all the assets and google's algorithm is supposed to handle this so just to to wrap this up i think a final frontier here well we don't know what is going to be the final frontier it's still very new technology but one thing that that bugs me a little bit i think it's very important how to say this i think it's very important that we're optimizing based on orders and thinking about the orders that we're going to generate and 
because that that's the output. We're t we have this input output thing with the, the black box in between. And the challenge there is that on the input side, we have to optimize based on, on products. And this framework that I've been discussing is very product centric. But in the end, these products are going to produce orders where they might not even participate in the final order. You know, maybe I given the product that got that got clicked will get also purchased, and that's the whole order. But maybe an add-on is getting purchased with it, or maybe it's getting purchased in multiple size and color variants, and there's going to be returns on that. Or maybe that product got completely substituted and wasn't purchased at all. And, you know, there's this kind of linearity or degree of chaos that exists in that clicked versus bought, in that product versus order phenomena. And then the other dimension to it is the profitability of, of what occurred there. Was it a good thing that occurred? Was it an upsell? Was it a downsell? Was it a high return situation? And I think unifying the picture there, kind of closing that gap and that discrepancy insofar as possible is is an open challenge. It's something, it's an active area of research for, for myself and some of my colleagues. And I'm sure many of you have great ideas about that too. So let me know if you do. But sort of a final word here. I view this technology with a, I guess you could say, a bit of caution, but also with the expectation that we need to be pragmatic here. This is the way Google wants their platform to look in the future. We're probably not gonna be able to change their mind on that. Even, yeah, this stuff comes from very high level at Google and it's hard to change course on that. So there's gonna be an extent to which we need to adapt our expectations and, and change our minds. Um, one of those would be not thinking about return on ad spend as a goal that needs to be achieved. It's really, it's, it's not your, your goal or your mission to achieve that. It actually, Google's technology bears the responsibility of that. But, you know, assuming that Google is able to reliably hit these targets, <laughs> I know it can be a big assumption, but then the return on advertising spend is a lever that you can use to help pace uh, the, the budget since it, it, well, that's not entirely the case with Performance Max, but a high amount of the volume could be expected to come from paid search, uh, shopping and, and text ads. And uh, these are these are pull channels, not push channels. So you can just because you're throwing budget out there doesn't mean that the budget's going to get consumed. Um, you need to pace that budget with uh, the efficiency targets that you set and understand that those are efficiency targets and not profit targets. Profit is a goal, but if efficiency is a tool. Yeah, then I think thinking not only in terms of, of total growth, but targeted growth and uh, different ways that, that we can understand that, but new customer acquisition being an interesting one and making sure that this tool is really performing in a way that's incremental and that's somewhere where we can work as hard as we can to hold it accountable. We're going to need to just increasingly trust automation technology that we can't see inside of where, yeah, this, this, this black box topic again, and just think, okay, it is what it is. How can I make the most of it? Or if it's really not acceptable, people will send their advertising dollars elsewhere. And biggest of all here is just accepting this, this de-channeling that's occurring with search, shopping, display, performance max, is a soup of all of those things. And that's very much by design. This de-channeling strategy is, is on purpose. And it might not be the way that your organization is set up. You might have an organization that is, is split according to channel and then suddenly you've got uh, Google blurring the lines there. And this can be confusing, it can be frustrating, but so far, I, I'm expecting very high adoption and very fast adoption on Performance Max. If we look at how long it took smart bidding to get a foothold on the market and get a, a really a sizable market share, if we look at how, let's say it was four years, if we look at how long it took um, smart shopping campaigns, of course, there was sort of a beta phase where they were called goal-optimized campaigns, but 
once Google really committed to that and started pushing it, it took about two years. And I think it's going to halve again, and we're going to see a significant amount of performance max adoption uh, this year, you know, in basically a one year time frame. And that's partly due to the migration that they'll enforce. But it's also each of those previous technologies has helped ease the way for the next technology that follows. And yeah, it doesn't mean that standard campaigns are going away. We can still use those, especially in the case of, of the non-shopping channels where ad rank is more used to prioritize in shopping. That's basically, you can't really run that in parallel to performance max or you have to do it very carefully. I think there are perhaps use cases, but it has to be done really carefully. And the other cases, uh, Google saying that based on ad rank, the, the better campaign will serve. But I think over time, we can expect the volume to shift increasingly toward performance max. Yeah, my last word is just think about this with in a very critical way, open-minded, but critical, and think, all right, this is the technology that is available to me. How can I use that better than anyone else? And my take on that, or our take on that, is that you can do this by optimizing toward business objectives, bringing in better information toward the campaigns and holding the campaigns more accountable. And that way you can make sure you're winning the right customers, getting the right revenue, the revenue that is profitable, and really operating the channel in a way that's more sustainable as it becomes increasingly competitive. And a quick plug, if you head over to smarter-ecommerce.com, visit the blog, um, and you can view the article form of this I've written, which has some more details. There's some interesting data sets and visualizations in there. Hopefully interesting. <laughs> or you can just Google it. The article is called Performance Max Campaigns, Successful Strategies for Online Retail. So thanks for listening to Growing E-Commerce. And if you enjoy this podcast, please consider sharing it with coworkers, friends, or within your professional network on LinkedIn, Twitter. We really appreciate it. This podcast is produced by Smarter E-Commerce. To learn more, visit smarter-ecommerce.com.